so we're going to run uh, some exercise tests today and we're going to look at some of the markers for performance. Uh, we'll run a couple of tests. The first one we'll do will be a very easy test. It'll uh, probably last about 15 minutes. And we're going to look to see how efficient uh, the cyclist is today and uh, see how well the, the, he uses the energy to make power. Uh, we'll do a second test after that. It starts off at a really uh, low intensity and uh, builds up. And we're going to look and see what his maximum capacity is at so we can see what he's capable of. And then uh, along with that, we'll take some measurements in between there and we will get an idea of what he can do for a more prolonged period of time. Okay? Uh, once we get done with that, we're going to run one more test to look at force production under the pedal. And we'll take a look and see uh, how much force he's actually making. Uh, becoming increasingly more interested in, in this lab and in looking at muscle performance. Uh, a lot of people test things like VO2 max and lactate threshold. Those are words that buzz around quite a bit. But oftentimes you see cyclists and you know maybe two people have a similar VO2 max and a similar lactate threshold, yet they perform very differently on the bike. Some time trial very well, some sprint very well, and so we become very interested in looking at the um, muscle aspects. And so we want to take a look at some of those measurements today. Okay, and um, the end result is this helps guide training or? Absolutely. So by doing this we can look and see what the cyclist strengths, weaknesses are and then we can then focus training to strengthen those weaknesses and not continue to train the strength, which is what's very common most people do. What are we doing right now? So right now we're running a test to look at Chris's economy. So basically that's trying to determine how many liters of oxygen it costs him to do a given wattage. So, you know, if someone has a really, really high economy, you can kind of think about it as having really good gas mileage. So they're able to utilize the oxygen that they consume really well as mechanical power on the bike. So we're taking a look at what this can do. So you, you, you hit 70, 78, uh, so a VO2 max, we, the units we use for this is, the, that's the milliliters of oxygen your body was consuming per kilogram of your body weight every minute, okay? So at some point, you know, every time we, we put a little bit more, put 35 more watts on the bike, your oxygen consumption went up. And we consume more oxygen because we need oxygen to make energy, okay? And so people that have a large VO2 max, that means they have a large amount of oxygen, it means they can generate a lot of energy. So we kept going along, going along, and I loved your analogy, you're good till you're not. And for you, you're good till you're not meant that um, at some point, we keep making it a little harder, a little harder, at some point, the oxygen consumption stopped going up. We kept moving up the workload on the bike and kept asking more of you, but your body just stopped consuming oxygen. And that's that point when you're not good anymore. 
okay? <laughs> 78 mLs per kg per minute is extremely high. This is, this is like a professional cyclist high. So you so better win today, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> so, so from, I mean, so from what, what those numbers say then, like what, what does that mean uh, as, as an athlete? Like, um, you know, does it, does it help with how to train or does it help with how to race or like does it, does it tell us anything beyond, hey, you're good? There are other var variables that we're going to take out of here for you. They take a little bit more data processing. And one of the things that become really, really important for people to understand is what they're sensitive to. Um, so for me, I'm what, what we call speed sensitive. Um, long rides kill me. And I mean, like, send me out for a long ride, and I'm, and I'm, I'm really bad for like a week. Uh, some, I do really good with short, hard rides, though. Um, so speedy rides are really good for me. And so part of that is we can also help you figure out what type of training is best for you and what is most going to be most effective for your body. So I, I, maybe a, another question, like this is a setup, right? We are, we are in a lab, we're in a place, we, we have very professional people, doctors, and uh, is there a way for, for someone that doesn't have access to this to, to, to leverage some of this type of training in, in their everyday? Absolutely, there are, there are certainly ways to do this. Uh, we've devised a number of, of field testing methods. Well, the great thing about today is everybody's got this rolling laboratory on their bicycle, right? You know, at the times we couldn't do anything. Now we can, we can figure out power and force production and heart rate. And um, there's even like undershirts you can wear now that tell you like how fast you're breathing and how deep you're breathing. I mean, we, it's amazing the things we can do. Sure. Um, and it's great because people that don't, maybe don't have access to a laboratory can do these type, this type of testing kind of on their own. Is it, and I will say this, is it as sensitive as this? It's, it's not. I mean, it's the reason to still come to the lab. This is still the standard. But we can get really close by just using uh, variables in the field as well. And then, a, and then a, a difficult question there might not be an answer to. How much of it can be trained? How much of it are you just born with? Okay, that's a really good question. Um, it's, it's, a, it's, a very <laughs> hot, it's a very hot topic. Um, you know, both are really important. Um, and our field has really evolved over the years, you know. Going through the 90s, as we, it was really like the gene revolution. We started to figure out genes were important. You know, heart sizes, fiber types for muscles, blood volumes. A lot of it was gene determined. There's some people that you meet often in times that you, they train minimally or haven't trained at all, and they jump on the bike, and they're really fast. And you're like, what is going on with this person? It's a person that's very genetically gifted. And through the 90s, we, we actually didn't focus, a lot of the research didn't focus as much on training because we thought you were just born as an athlete or you weren't. But as it turns out, um, there's actually a more substantial portion that training brings to this now. So in the early 2000s, we started uh, a new kind of revolution of, of research evolved, looking at high intensity training with athletes. And what we found is that, wow, we could improve things like a VO2 max, even in a highly trained person, which we thought un un unthinkable. The person was either born with it or they weren't. They rode for a couple of years, developed it, and that was as far as they could go. And so now we're starting to find out that training has a much more substantial response. Um, we typically think from an untrained to a trained person that the increase in VO2 max may be about 30%. Wow. So, Pretty yeah, significant. It, it is. It's significant, but it's also not as high as you would think. So, you know, if you're an untrained person and, you know, you're, you're, you've never trained a day in your life and you come in and you're telling me that your VO2 max is 25 you're not going to get up to 78. You're probably not ever going to catch Chris. Yeah, it's not going to happen. You're probably not going to catch up to Chris. But it also doesn't mean that you're, you're never going to see an, an improvement. That's one of the reasons we tell people you've got to train, whether you're a superstar athlete or a person who's trying to become a healthier person. You can make substantial improvements. It's not all just gene-based. So um, as important as genes are, we're now starting to understand that, that, that we can do a lot to influence our genes as well just through training itself. I, I'm, I'm curious, maybe one, yeah. one last thing. Uh, so for, for an athlete that is training uh, frequently, 
in a in a given year, you know, yeah. how much will their VO two vary in that, and and what does that mean? Like, so in my off season, I haven't ridden for a long time. Yeah. Will my number, you know, will it drop to sixty, and then throughout the season, does it rise, or, or how how does that play? Again, diff difficult question because yeah. it depends on. Some people say well, I, I've been off the bike, and for some people, you know, I, I coach a lot of people, and some people say they've been off the bike and they're still riding five days a week for an hour, you know, and that, that's not really off yeah. the bike. But some people say they're off the bike, you know, they're off, like they don't touch it for like a month or more. So it really depends. Obviously, the less you're on it, the more that it's going to drop. Sure. Um, I would say seasonally, most people that I work with, if they really take a good off season break, they maybe drop anywhere from 8 to 10 percent and then they can usually build that back up and going through their base and back through their building through their speed and their power angles they usually can get that back and maybe even get a little bit more out of it so that, that can change a whole lot okay thank you doctor my pleasure my thank pleasure you. thank you